Welcome and thank you for joining us for the spring 2015 Bond Corps lecture. My name is Carl Johnson. I'm the executive director of Chesterton House, the Center for Christian Studies here at Cornell. Our guest this evening, Mr. Joel Salatin, describes himself as a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist lunatic. And my strange privilege is to try to improve upon that as an introduction. First things first, the Vine Court Lecture is made possible by the generosity of Carl and Elaine Noyce in honor of their friends Al and Linda Vine Court. The late Al Vine Court was a member of the Cornell class of 1966, and I would like to extend our warmest Ithaca greetings to the Vine Court and Noyce families who are joining us via webcast from the oppressive environs of Southern California. <laughs> Chesterton House is a Center for Christian Studies at Cornell, an affiliate member of Cornell United Religious Work, and the Vine Court Lectureship is designed to address questions of faith and public life. Past Vine Court lecturers have included historians, a sociologist, a literary scholar, and last year, the president of one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the world. This evening, we welcome a farmer. And it's true, one of these things is not like the others. And while I don't feel obligated to justify our selection of speaker, I'm going to do it anyway. One century ago, For an alternative vision of society and civilization that was more democratic in part because it was more agrarian. The problem with capitalism, he said, is that there are not enough capitalists. By which he meant that modern society tends strongly towards centralization and that we would all be better off if there were more entrepreneurship, more self-employment, and a more widespread ownership of capital. More specifically, more widespread and small-scale ownership of property. The cure for centralization, he said, is decentralization. And for Chesterton, decentralization was not just a vision for economic flourishing, but it was a means of subordinating economic life to a more robust vision of human flourishing, to family life, to intellectual life, to spiritual life, in short, to the good life. And so ironically, this gargantuan man inspired the small is beautiful movement. Our guest this evening, in addition to being a well-known speaker and writer and author of several books, owns and operates a 550-acre family farm whose claim to fame is, in part, that they don't ship food. Which seems like a bit of an oxymoron in this day and age. After all, what is a farm for? They don't ship food, he says, because we want prospective customers to find farms in their areas and keep the money in their community. Because some values are more important than growth, and because, get this, there is strength in decentralization. Why did we invite our guest, Mr. Salatin, to speak in this particular venue on faith and public life? Well, in his life and work at Polyface Farms, he is modeling a way of living and a way of making a living that would make Chesterton proud, and it makes us proud to have him with us here this evening. Please join me in welcoming author, speaker, and lunatic farmer philosopher, Mr. Joel Salatin. Thank you, it's really a pleasure to uh, be with you this evening. 
and to be able to talk about something that's so near and dear to my heart. You know, I spend a lot of time with um, um, liberal greedy foodie, you know, earth muffin types. And um, it's really cool to be able to come out of the closet and be my overtly, you know, uh, Christian self. Uh, I, don't, I don't get too much of uh, time to be able to do that. So um, just a little bit about, about where I uh, came from growing up. Um, you know, I grew up in this real conservative southern um, uh, family in the, in the 60s. If you remember, this was the Vietnam era, you know, the beginning of, of uh, flower power and hippies and uh, uh, marijuana and free love and all that. And, and it was interesting. Uh, I never thought anything about the fact that, that on the farm, our, our uh, friends were all uh, um, hippie, uh, dope smoker, mar- I mean, I smelled a lot of marijuana, you know. These were our friends, because, you know, we sat around, we talked about humanure and compost and earthworms and, and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, solariums and solar energy and, and you know, uh, the, the vast uh, uh, corporate conspiracy, you know, and all this. <clears throat> and then on Sunday, you know, we went, sat down here with these people that uh, thought all those people were nutcases. And... Uh, I remember very well when uh, Dad started making um, uh, Adele Davis's um, Tiger Milk. Some of you might remember that. You know, you put you put it in a blender, Tiger Milk, and all of our church friends called it Panther Puke. Okay, but but you know, th- this is the way we grew up, and um, and I didn't think a whole lot about it until I was in um, in school, and uh, I went to that ultra conservative uh, school. Uh, Bob Jones University in South Carolina. Some of you may have heard of it. You've probably heard things about it. Yeah, they do have, you know, blue and pink sidewalks to keep the girls and guys separate, you know, all sorts of things. Not really. Um, but here I was a senior, and I was a leader on campus, you know. I was president of society, and I did different things, and, and you know, official tour guide and all this stuff. And uh, the magazine came in. Uh, the, the university had this official, slick, nice uh, four-color magazine at the time, and um, came under the dormitory door, and I opened it up, and it was a magazine about the food, the food uh, fads. And uh, halfway through the article, sure enough, you know, I was sitting here and I was watching. I said, "Oh, this thing's not going good places." And uh, halfway through the article, here our chancellor was quoted as saying, "If you step inside a health food store, you have joined a food cult. A cult." And, uh, and our family had been going to health food store ever since the first one came to town, you know. So, you know, I kind of closed the magazine and, hmm, you know, okay, now what do you, you know, what, what do you do here? And that was an aha moment for me because I didn't realize at that point how much tension there was. I know now how much there is. And, and, uh, so what's happened is that we have this, because the environmental movement kind of grew out of, you know, Aldo Leopold, John Moore, and, and, and Audubon, and, the, and these kind of, these kind of uh, naturalists that, that, that were, um, for lack of a better term, you know, uh, early creation worshipers. I mean, they, they, they really saw that. They, they were not godly people. They, uh, they were not Bible readers. They, they were, they were, they were uh, pantheists. You know, they grew out of the, the British romantic poets, Bish, Ellie Keats. You know, I never saw anything as beautiful as a tree. You know, he never gives any glory to the creator of the tree. It's the glory of the tree, you know, itself. That because of that, it tainted the stewardship movement in the conservative Christian community to brand everybody who dared to protect a tree by hugging it, or uh, to talk about you know, uh, um, Earth care, or Earth Day, or environmentalism, or animal welfare, or any of that kind of stuff. You know, you couldn't have that discussion. In a, in a church fellowship setting, because if you did, you know, you were branded a commie, pinko, liberal, tree-hugging, earth-muffin abortionist, you know. <laughs> and so this, this tension, uh, this tension con- continues, it continues today. The point is, the point is that the, that the, the I, I believe, I believe that the Religious right, the evangelical right, the faith community, call it what you want to. 34% of Americans that, that, that label themselves as some sort of an evangelical faith uh, community, that, that creation stewardship 
has been given over, that moral high road of, of, of creation stewardship has been given over to creation worshipers rather than as a mandate and part of the visceral manifestation of being a creator worshiper. Okay? And so, so we've squandered this, this moral high ground and, and given it over. So here's my thesis, all right? My thesis is this, that the physical creation that we see is, an, is God's object lesson of spiritual truth. Say that one more time. The physical creation we see is God's object lesson of spiritual truth. You know, uh, St. Augustine, uh, started this, this, this Western reductionist, linear, compartmentalized, disconnected, segregated, parts-oriented, uh, democratized pieces, parts all about me kind of thinking, when he brought up the fact, the dualism, you know, that, that, that spirit is good and if you can see it, it's evil. But you know, the Bible is not written like that. The scriptures are full of physical things from parables to object lessons to typology. It's throughout there. And so let's just, let's just examine one, for example, just to show you where I'm, where I'm headed. The uh, Shorter Catechism. Can anybody tell me, the Shorter Catechism, what is the end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You must be a deformed Presbyterian. I mean a Reformed Presbyterian. All right. <laughs> To glorify God and live with Him forever. All right, and we talk about bringing glory to God, don't we? Uh, at Christmas, we just had Christmas not long ago. You know, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Um, we we tend to um, kind of elevate things to spiritual uh, lingo. You know, we uh, some 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 ministers, for example. Uh, when they pray in uh, the fellowship uh, a church in a public prayer, you know, they, they always kind of, they end, end with a, not, they don't just say amen, they say amen, you know, kind of a, it's a, it's a spiritualized amen, you know, I mean, this is a public place, you know, so you spiritualize. And, and we do that with glory. We, we don't use glory in common usage. That's, that's reserved for church speak. That's, that's reserved for religious speak, for, are you with me? And, and so we don't use glory in these other things. But the Bible uses glory in all sorts of physical ways. I mean, it talks about the glory of old men is their gray head. The glory of young men is their strength. It talks about the glory of nations, that each nation has a glory. Uh, it talks about the glory of things celestial, like the sun and the moon and the stars, and the glory of things terrestrial, like trees and birds and pigs and things like that. The, the, the Bible is extremely visceral when it uses the term glory. It doesn't reserve it for, you know, religious speak. It, it, it uses it for very physical, visceral things. So what does, what does it mean to bring glory to, to something? Obviously, God is not the only one we're supposed to give glory to. We're supposed to recognize the glory in all these other things. What does it mean to bring glory to something? The, 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 the glory of something is its distinctiveness, its uniqueness. It's, it's the thing that separates it from everything else. And so when we, bring, when we bring glory to God, we are recognizing and honoring His specialness. What makes Him God as opposed to any other being, as opposed to any other thing, as opposed to any other universe? It's, it's, it's God's specificity that we're supposed to honor. His holiness, His mercy, His sovereignty, His omniscience, omnipresence, okay, those are uniquely, we don't have those attributes. We, they are not part of our being, okay? But that's, that's the glory of God. And so when we honor those, that's how we recognize his distinctiveness. So when we tell our kids, 
and we recite the catechism to them, you're supposed to bring glory to God. The kids see this word glory, glory. What does that mean? What does that mean? You know, and, and, and it comes in this kind of cerebral focus group and academic theological you know, universe that doesn't have a practical representation in everyday life. What if, just imagine, if when the family sat down to dinner, and the children sat around the table, <clears throat> mom or dad said, the reason that we're eating this pastured pig from Farmer Ben's farm down the road is because Farmer Ben honors the glory of the pig. At his farm, he understands that, that the distinctiveness of the pig is worthwhile. That's part of his sanctity of life, his, his part of his, 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 um, his paradigm, is that it does matter whether we honor the pigness of the pig. And so, so because he honors the pigness of the pig and letting the pig run around and get fresh air and you use his plow on the end of his nose to, to, to use root up things and eat bugs and, and worms along with his feed and, and, and all that, that honors, that allows the pig to be all the pig that the pig can be. <laughs> and that's what it means to bring glory to God in our lives when we, when we honor God in all the specialness that's Him. This is why we do that to God. This is what it looks like. It looks like honoring the pig right here in that barnyard. The way we honor that pig is the object lesson for bringing reverence and honor to the distinctiveness of God. Okay? Suddenly, our little human brains at four years old, we can get that. Isn't that cool? See, we can, get, we can wrap our heads around that. That's something we can, we can grasp, uh, uh, grasp onto. Contrast that with the, um, with the U.S. duh notion U.S. duh, U.S.D.A., U.S. duh. <clears throat> I realize I'm in Cornell, but I'm going to still use it. It's one of my signature pieces. I don't change my message just because I'm in a different, you know, place. <clears throat> According to our culture, you know, not just the U.S. duh, our culture, nobody dares to ask the question of whether or not it's important to honor the pigness of the pig. When's the last time you heard about a land-grant university research project in which the scientists sat around and said, now, now, let's study the essence of pig and what makes a pig the best, happiest, the happiest pig possible? No, I mean, right now we're spending money on research on how to figure out where the stress gene is on the DNA, poor sign DNA strand, so we can strip that out of their genetic code and we can abuse them more, but at least they won't be stressed about it. Now, what does that say to our children when that's the pig we eat and then we say, now, give God his distinctiveness? See the hypocrisy? You see, you see how the two don't compute? And so what it is, we raise our, we raise our children, we raise our families in this, in this strange world of where our, our walk and our talk, our theology and our practice don't, don't get together, you see. And so we come up, we come up conflicted. I mean, the U.S. Dove told us for years they took farmers like me to free steak dinners for 30 years to teach us this new scientific way of feeding cows where we take dead cows and we grind them up and we cook them and then we feed them back to cows. And they did feeding trials to show that there was no difference and they did growth trials to show that it was, more, uh, that it was cheaper, all these things. And when our farm didn't endorse that science, we were branded as Luddites, Neanderthals, barbarians. What do you want to do? Go back to, you know, hoop skirts, washboards, and, and you know, 1700s colonial bedpans. You know, what do you want to do? 
30 years later, suddenly there's this big global, oops. What was the, why? Well, why was because it violates God's order. God is a God of order. And he has specified diets. He has specified patterns and how things are supposed to work. And one of the patterns is herbivores don't eat carry-on. In fact, I do a lot of school tours. And these kids will come out, you know. And uh, 10 years old, you know, you say, uh, what do you call an animal that eats uh, meat? Only meat, you know. And get carnivore. Well, what do you call an animal that eats only plants? Of course, the kids yell out, herbivores. Thank you. I mean, we are at Cornell. You're supposed to know these things. <laughs> and then for the big bonus question, what if they eat both? Omnivores. So I'm standing out in the field with these, you know, kids in front of me, and I've got this big herd of, you know, cows behind me. So I turn around, and I say, what are those? Cows. I know. There's always a wise guy in every crowd. No. I'm looking for herbivore, carnivore, or omnivore. What is it? Herbivore. Then can you tell me why our PhD academic credential licensed experts of our country, supposedly the smartest and brightest people in our country, told us for 30 years to feed them like an omnivore? Hey! And all the kids get all grimacy faces. And why would they do that? You know, I'm saying, you know, you 12 year olds do a lot better at running the U.S. Dove than what's down there. <laughs> you see, when you start looking at the patterns and you start looking at the templates that God laid down, they become pretty specific and pretty direct. And part of this is honoring the distinctives of that being. Because it's in honoring that distinctiveness of the being, respecting and honoring the pigness of the pig, that creates an object lesson for understanding what honoring the distinctiveness and the specificity of divinity is. Of people, of other cultures, the glory of other nations, See, it has broad ramifications. They don't believe like us. Let's go bomb them and shoot them. You know, no, no, that's not a biblical deal. All right? But it all starts with how we respect and honor the least of these. That's what sets the ethical framework on which we hang honoring and respecting the greatest of these. We can't have a culture that honors and respects the Thomas of Tom unless we start with the pigness of pig. Are you with me? And you can't have a culture that honors the distinctiveness of other cultures when you don't honor the most basic stuff, the, the most basic elements of life. And so, so what's, what's happened is in our culture, we, we have morphed into you know, going from uh, uh, not a, a pantheistic, but going the opposite way to where we view life as fundamentally mechanical. And that gives us license to manipulate it, however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate it. And so that it, there, there is no specialness to a pig, a cow, a sheep. I mean, I mean, uh, however we can, however we can manipulate it with our own creativity, the better off we are, without regard to any other ideas, without any any sacredness to that life. And so I would suggest that that life is fundamentally biological, and in fact, it is the taking of that life in death, whether you chomp down on a carrot and kill the carrot, or chomp down on a chicken breast because you've killed the chicken. I assume nobody's going to chomp down on it while the chicken's still alive. <laughs> the, the point is that in order, for, in order for there to be life, there must be death. That's the most foundational principle of ecology. And anybody that says, oh, come on, we, you know, can't we, haven't we progressed beyond you know, taking uh, you know, killing animals in order uh, to live. Look, but the fact is, everything is eating and being eaten, and if you don't believe it, go lie naked in your flower bed for three days and see what gets eaten. <laughs> everything is eating and being eaten. <laughs> everything. 
And the cycle of life is life, death, decomposition, regeneration, life, death, decomposition, regeneration. That's the cycle of life. It is the most foundational principle of ecology that there is. You can't escape it. And I would suggest that what gives that cycle sacredness is the honoring of the life while it was living. That we create sacredness to the sacrifice, to the necessary sacrifice, in the way we, we gave glory to that being, whether it's a tomato, a carrot, or a chicken, or a pig, we honor, we create sacredness to the sacrifice in the way we honored the, the being in its life. If we desecrate the being in its life and consider it just mechanical, uh, inanimate, protoplasmic structure to be manipulated, however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate it, we cheapen the sacrifice. We cheapen the death. We cheapen the value of life. And we elevate life when we bring glory to the specialness of each of these critters that we, that we take. So the point is, when we start looking at how do we design then a food and farm system, let, let's just look at that. A food and farm system, can we design one? What does one look like that actually, that actually creates an object lesson or, 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 or physical, a visceral manifestation of, of, of great spiritual principles. For example, what does a farm that manifests forgiveness look like? I would suggest that a forgiving farm is one that shows resiliency. You know, uh, Stephen Covey in Heaven and Heaven and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about um, um, building emotional equity in each other's gas tanks as the foundation for relational uh, team building, uh, that, that all of us are going to have a bad day. We're going to make a, we're going to make an emotional withdrawal from our spouse once in a while, our children once in a while, our, 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 our uh, you know, housemates, our friends, whatever. Okay. We're, we're going to have a bad day. We're going to, we're going to make an emotional withdrawal by an unfit word. Okay. The point is that we have to put enough emotional equity in the gas tank so there's a reserve to draw on so the relationship doesn't collapse over a, a withdrawal. Are you with me? That's, that's, his, that's my paraphrase of his seven habits of highly effective people idea of emotional equity. Forgiveness works like that. So, so if we're going to have a farm that's resilient, that's forgiving, it has to have, it has to have uh, um, biological, economic, and emotional equity enough for there to be some withdrawals. Because the fact is, there are going to be floods and droughts and winds and, and hail and whatever. So how do, we, how do we build that into a farm? How do, we, how do we make a farm that when people come and visit, they leave saying, oh, I just saw what forgiveness looks like. Is everybody with me what I'm trying to get to here on the object lesson idea? All right? And so I would suggest that a forgiving farm is one that gets control of its hydrologic style, uh, uh, cycle, first of all. In other words, so that it can handle droughts and floods. Well, that means we're going to be building some ponds. That means we're going to be, uh, we're going to be creating resiliency there. And this is especially true in, in, in dry areas. Okay, um, We're going to have animals and plants that exhibit tremendous immunological function. We're not going to have a bunch of pharmaceutical dependency. You know, the average farm in the U.S., if something gets sick or diseased, the first uh, um, assumption is, oh, it must be pharmaceutically disadvantaged. Well, what about the question, well, what have I done in management to let the hedge of protective immunity be breached by a pathogen? Because there really are way more good bugs and bad bugs. So if I'm building a habitat for good bugs, we don't have the bad bugs. So for example, in our brooder house with the little chicks, we keep deep bedding in there with a good carbon nitrogen ratio uh, uh, of, of 25 to 30 to one. 
That's a carbon-nitrogen ratio that allows nematodes and good bugs to proliferate. And it's deep enough that a community can develop it. They can have their schools and roads and highways and, you know, science clubs and all this stuff because there's enough distance there. You see, the industry doesn't use enough carbon, so their carbon ratio, their, their carbon-nitrogen ratio is down there in the, in the, you know, 11 to 1 ratio, so it's toxic. You can smell the ammonia from a mile away. And the birds are living in a toxic fecal particulate ammonia environment, which comes in and abrades their mucous membranes and then creates lesions, which then require antibiotics to, to, to scrape them, to, to uh, keep them from getting infection. And you have this, this, uh, uh, this toxic production system. Um, uh, you know, pathogenicity. Um, so, so, so forgiveness, all right, that's what we're looking at. So what we want is a farm that, that illustrates that it can take shocks, that, that, that it can take some punches, and it, it can take some licks and keep on ticking, as they say. Take a lick and keep on ticking. How about a, how about a farm that exhibits, I mean, in the Christian experience, we say that we're, fun, we're not a religion, we're a relationship. Okay, and that's exactly correct. So how do we have a farm that fosters relationships there's a farm that fosters relationships one that 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 skews toward machinery gps driven driverless tractors and monospeciation or is it a farm with multi-speciation lots of people and intricate complex plant animal communities that work together is it relational? I'd even take this a step further. Um, we have multiflora rows on our farm. Do you have multiflora rows up here? Yeah, my, my father-in-law calls it multiple roses because they're always multiplying. Um, these multiflora roses, you know, they're, they're an invasive and they, they've come in in the last uh, 50 years. And um, they're really noxious. And most of the farmers in our area uh, get, you know, bicep or some, uh, you know, some uh, herbicide and go out there on their four wheelers and, and they, you know, they, they shoot these, they shoot this um, herbicide over and try to uh, control them that way in the summer. But we don't use the herbicides because of, we don't want to use the herbicides. And so what I've done is I've made some long handled mattocks. You know, mattocks have a pretty short handle, but I, I, I go up and cut, you know, cut saplings and put one on there about, you know, four or five feet long, so it's or longer, five feet. So you can, you know, get in under a big old multiflora road, you can whack that thing out. Now, now, you know, when I do this, um, I'm thinking about brambles shall come up and infest the ground, you know. I look at these things as, as sin. <laughs> And I get my mattock out there, and I come up to that big old sin, and I get that mattock, and I, I, I look for that, you know, the, 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 big, the big root, you know. Oh, it looks like it's right here, you know, and you whack, and you stand back a little bit, you know, and then and you, take a, you, know, you take a swipe this way, you know, and now it's teetering a little bit, and you can see where the rest of the roots come out, and, you, and, and boy, you, you get right in there, and finally, you know, you get that last whack, Take that last root out and you jerk it. I got you, you sin, you know. <laughs> Throw it aside. That, that creates a whole different understanding and relationship than sitting here on a four-wheeler, you know, engine idling, you know, from 20 feet away. 20 feet away. What a great object lesson of how we should wrestle with sin. You know, sin, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't sit here from 20 feet away and shoot some bicep at it from a, from a nozzle of a four-wheeler. No, sin, you got to get in there. You got to look at it and where's your root, buddy? You know, I'm going to get you, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you out of here. And, and, and we develop this, this wrestling with sin and get it out of here. And I'm going to pull you out by the roots. I'm not going to depend on some concoction from, you know, Siba Geige to deal with it. I'm going to deal with you, not somebody else. And I'm going to knock you out of my field. Now, let me ask you something. Wouldn't it be cool? If next month's um, youth group activity, instead of being a trip 
to, uh, to Six Flags or whatever, you, you know, uh, Coney Island to, to, a, 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 to, to, you know, to the fun station, what if the youth group all got equipped with Maddox and went out to some farmer's place and said, we want to we wanna find out what it's like to wrestle with sin. We're going we're gonna to get these out of your fields. Can you show us some multiflora rows to, 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 to get a relationship and conquer? Now, you know, thank you for laughing, but, but there, there's, listen, I am dead serious. I am dead serious. What would that do to the youth group to come back and have that kind of visceral relationship with brambles, the metaphor, the type of sin in the scripture? Suddenly, those passages, wherever it grows, you know, the slothful man, you know, brambles grow up in his vineyard, the, you know, in the Proverbs, all the way to, you know, the result of sin, you know, brambles, thistles and thorns overtake the ground. Suddenly, those passages, what happens? They come alive, don't they? They're not just academic. I mean, the average young person today, I mean, they've never encountered a bramble. I mean, all they've encountered is wiggling their thumbs in front of some sort of a computer game, uh, um, you know, uh, being a, a fantasy, fantasy life. They're, they're not participating in the physical universe. They're not partaking of the object lesson. And I think we deprive, we deny our families and our young people and ourselves, we deny ourselves the impact, the, the, what, it, what does it mean? As Francis Schaeffer said, how then shall we live? What does this mean? Our, 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 our Christianity, folks, is not to be just some theological focus group discussion among academics sitting around with Bibles talking about you know, uh, words on a page and esoteric mystical thinking. It's visceral. It's physical. What does a farm that exhibits a whosoever will mentality? I mean, the most famous verse in the Bible, right? John three sixteen, For God's love the world, and whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever will. I mean, it's, it's the mantra of the Christian community. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go on a pilgrimage. You don't have to, you know, pay any money to anybody. You don't even have to recite a catechism or move beads around or do anything. It's whosoever will by faith and faith alone. That is, that is, the, that is, the, that is the glory of Christianity. Okay. Well, what does a whosoever will type of farm and food system look like? I would suggest that a whosoever will system is one in which it's easy to get into and easy to get out of, one that, that, that young people like to come into. I mean, the average American farmer is now 60 years old. It's a dying vocation. There, it, 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 uh, Wall Street, the business uh, journals tell us that any uh, economic sector of, an, uh, of a culture in which the average practitioner is over 35 is a sector in decline. Farming is now almost 60. Obviously, there's something wrong with people being able to get in. So a whosoever will farm is one that uses low capitalization, not high capitalization, multiple use infrastructure, not single use infrastructure, portable infrastructure, not stationary infrastructure. It is resilient inside. Its fertility base does not depend on what comes from a bag. Its fertility base comes from a carbon centricity internally. It doesn't depend on everything from outside. It's not a flow through. It's a reservoir of energy run with real time solar energy, not petroleum that actually runs on real time that doesn't cost anything. Petroleum costs, solar energy doesn't cost anything. You harvest it with chlorophyll. Okay? Suddenly you have a farm in which anybody can participate. It's not exclusive. I mean, if you want to raise pastured chickens today, those of you who know me know I'm a big advocate of pastured chickens, you can start with a little portable floorless shelter. 
You can, you can build one of these for a couple hundred bucks, put some chickens in there, run several cycles in a summer, and for a two or three hundred dollar investment, you can harvest a thousand dollars worth of chickens, pay for all the infrastructure and net a profit in your very first season. Compare that to if you want to grow a chicken for Tyson. Before you even buy one chicken, you have to build a $500,000 house that's on a contract with them, batch to batch to batch. They don't guarantee that after you run your first batch, they won't pull your contract and not give you chickens again. No guarantee whatsoever. Folks, that's hard to get into. Whosoever will. So, what are some things that churches can do? I'll, I'll just stop there. You, you, but you, you see the, the, the train of thought, the idea. You take these great truths and you say, what does that look like on the land? What does that look like in the field? So just imagine, um, what if we turned our lawns into gardens? You know, uh, churches make a big deal sometimes about, you know, collecting uh, um, uh, crashed and dented canned stuff from the industry to give to the homeless and the hungry and the food bank. Well, what if we, what if we turned the whole church lawn into gardens for, for uh, 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 poor people and gave them a place to grow food? What if we turned our church kitchen into a culinary art center? and let people come in and use it to can and showed them how to can and cook and, and, and created a culinary art center out of the church kitchen instead of having it sit there idle just for the country club participant church people once a month. What if we used our church group? I mean, we're meeting all the time. We're coming to a centralized place every week. How about the church group adopt five, six, ten farmers locally and have the farmers bring all the food that everybody eats when everybody gathers there anyway, and now suddenly nobody has to go to the broad way that leads to destruction called the supermarket, and, and they're embracing the narrow way, the alternative approach, and spending their money in the community instead of sending it to things that are completely opposite what they say they believe. And you leverage the buying power of the church group that's already there in meeting anyway to create a place for these five, six, seven, eight, ten farmers to come. Now you've employed ten farmers. They can quit their town jobs and actually do what they really want to do. And, and the church adopts these people and becomes integrated into the local food system. What if, what if at the next church potluck dinner, everybody brought cards, recipe cards at the dishes they brought? That means you can't bring Kentucky Fried Chicken and the source farms for the ingredients in the dishes to the church potluck. To create relationships. To create connections. To create an embracive and inclusive system rather than exclusive. These are all things that can put the Christian community in a high moral creation stewardship role. Folks, the earth is the Lord's. It's not ours. The earth is the Lord's. What kind of return on investment are we giving him for his investment in such an awesome net? So at our farm, our mantra is healing the land one bite at a time because ultimately if it's not healing, it's not acceptable. And just as God has extended his redemptive capacity into our lives spiritually to, as the catechism says, bring glory to himself and live with him forever. We are his hands and feet. We are his ambassadors here. We are the caretakers of his creation. And that is to be redeemed in a physical, visceral way as a, as a demonstration, as a demonstration of his redemptive capacity spiritually. And if the Christian community would rise up and take this, this visceral uh, uh, message, this visceral mission, and actually create oases of healing and landscape redemptive capacity in our farms, 
our landscapes, our lawns, our gardens, our food systems, we would demonstrate to our community the amazing, awesome healing power of our God. And I suggest that that is something big enough, sacred enough, awesome enough to occupy the life of every one of us. God help us to do it. Thank you so much.